thank you very much, uh, Rena, for the lovely introduction. And indeed, uh, thank you to everybody for coming out uh, this evening. I believe our weather is about to break, so thanks for making the time. Um, I'm delighted as well to be joined by uh, my friend and colleague Finn van Geldern. And I feel Finn in particular delivers a very powerful testimony uh, of recovery. And I know last month recovery was the topic uh, which uh, we would have looked at in, in this particular series. So while Finn delivers a particularly vivid account of his personal journey, I'd like to set the scene a little bit by providing some background information about major depressive disorder uh, with psychotic features. Okay, so just to get into it a little bit more, um, as we know, uh, we uh, are generally familiar with the idea of major depressive disorder and the various uh, signs and symptoms of the condition. However, I think it's worth to have worth our while having a brief uh, recap. Uh, so as you can see, uh, we're talking about five or more of the following uh, group of uh, symptoms being uh, present uh, during the same two week period. And that time frame is important. It's important that we look at time frame uh, when uh, we're considering uh, diagnosis. Uh, in addition to this, we must look at previous functioning and understand if there's a change from the person's baseline or their usual and ordinary activity. So is there a change in the person's functioning? I guess we're also looking at the two key uh, symptoms being depressed mood or loss of interest, sometimes referred to as anhedonia or a profound loss of enjoyment in previously enjoyed activities. So they might be two of the cardinal features of major depressive disorder or depression. So in looking at that then, we're talking about depressed mood for most of the day, nearly every day. Um, of course, this doesn't mean that the person can't have some uh, brief interludes where the mood is perhaps less depressed. But generally speaking, we're talking about a consistent and pervasive condition. Sometimes, too, people may experience uh, a change in their mood over the course of the day, uh, sometimes referred to as diurnal mood variation, where the person's mood may uh, improve as the day progresses or sometimes disimprove as the day progresses, uh, sometimes referred to as diurnal mood variation. So we're also looking at uh, what I might term biological features of depression, uh, where the person's appetite is affected, the person may experience weight loss or weight gain, uh, the person may encounter insomnia or hypersomnia, which is oversleeping. And insomnia in particular can be a difficult experience because occasionally a person can have difficulty getting to sleep or initial insomnia, other times a person might have middle insomnia or a broken sleep pattern. And other times still, a person might have early morning wakening. And of course, it's very difficult to feel refreshed or replenished when this is the case. And sometimes this can almost perpetuate uh, a cycle of depressed mood. Psychomotor agitation or, or retardation nearly every day. So the person might uh, be quite restless, which would be the agitation. The restlessness is something which is observable. Um, our loved ones or the people around us would, would be able to see this restlessness or agitation. Uh, other times the person may uh, be very slowed up and this feeling of being slowed up can manifest itself uh, in, in a physical sense but, but also in a, a cognitive or a thinking sense. Fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day. And of course, uh, sometimes uh, major depressive disorder or depression can be mistaken for other general medical conditions because some of these biological or physical symptoms of depression can mimic, uh, I guess, other physical general health conditions. 
Uh, an example might be um, hypothyroidism uh, or uh, a thyroid dysfunction. I guess the feelings of worthlessness or the excessive or the inappropriate guilt, um, these, these cognitive uh, symptoms or these emotional symptoms are particularly uh, troubling uh, and, I guess, distressing for a person. The piece about inappropriate guilt, I feel, is significant when we're looking at um, depression with psychotic features or psychotic depression because we're not uh, simply talking about feelings of guilt uh, towards the illness or a feeling of guilt because we are unwell or have been unwell. We might be talking about something uh, somehow more uh, pathological than that, uh, something which may uh, not uh, coincide with reality. A person, for example, may feel guilty of committing a crime, which in fact they did not commit. Uh, a person may feel uh, that they are sinful in some way, when in fact uh, there, there is no objective reason necessarily to feel that way. And these feelings, they can be overvalued, but they can also reach uh, delusional intensity, uh, which is something we'll return to in a few minutes. The inability to concentrate or the indecisiveness uh, is another very difficult uh, experience because, as we all know, perhaps we're trying to go about our day's work, maybe we're in school or in college, and it's difficult to keep up uh, with, with our usual routines. And of course, most significantly, the recurrent thoughts of death, the suicidal ideation, uh, perhaps with or without a, a plan, and we know that any expression uh, of, of, of suicidal ideation must be taken very seriously indeed, must be followed up assiduously, and I, I guess uh, treated with the utmost concern that it deserves. So these are some of the, the I guess, cardinal uh, signs and symptoms of depression taken from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, or the DSM-5, uh, which would be uh, I guess, a manual produced by the American Psychiatric uh, Association, which would outline all the criteria for the different mental health conditions. Of course, some people would say we shouldn't get too caught up with the idea of labels. And indeed, a, a diagnosis can, for some people, and in some cases, change over time, or people can experience remission. Um, however, um, as an area of scientific study or as an area of medicine, uh, it's important that we do have, uh, I guess, a sense of rigor when we come to look at any condition. I should add, of course, that diagnosis is really the, the place of a psychiatrist or uh, a registered medical practitioner. Um, and I'd be conscious in presenting these slides uh, that they are given for information purposes. Uh, and of course, I think the role of the psychiatrist in terms of really unpacking, you know, the different experiences can, can be significant alongside the person's own lived experience. And, you know, not to labor the point, but I think that's why uh, Finn's component of tonight's talk is so important because what we really must do now is instead of I guess, an expert uh, client, uh, perhaps, doctor or client clini clinician relationship, we must look at this idea of collaboration and ask the question, what do you think? Because I think the role of the clinician is very important and it's very useful to be able to work with the clinician. But the person's lived experience, the subjective experience, in many respects is, is, is where it's at uh, in terms of um, listening and identifying what's really happening. But just to look ahead for a moment and see what we mean when we talk uh, a little bit about um, reasons why uh, major depressive disorder mightn't uh, apply in an individual person's case. 
um, there must be significant distress or impairment in the person's functioning. Now this might be the person's uh, family life, it might be the person's work life, it might be the person's social life. So it, it must really, the condition must impact on the person's day-to-day -day functioning in, in some uh, significant way. It's also important to outrule uh, the effects of uh, alcohol or other drugs. Um, alcohol, as we know, is a depressant. Okay, it can lead to some uh, disinhibition in the early stages of alcohol use, but ultimately it is a depressant, uh, particularly in those days and period of time after taking alcohol. Um, over-the-counter medications, some over-the-counter medications as well, um, you know, uh, when misused, can have uh, some physiological impacts. Um, illicit or, or street drugs, uh, of course, as well, would have an effect. A lot of people in recent times have been talking about uh, new psychoactive substances, um, which in, in the recent years might have been referred to as head shop substances. And I guess the proliferation and the relative you know, ease which, which some of these drugs can be accessed, maybe on the internet or on the so-called dark net. Uh, so it's important in the case of depression just to outrule um, the effect of alcohol or other drugs, be they illicit or over-the-counter. It's also important to look at the role of other medical conditions as well. I've mentioned, uh, I guess, um, thyroid dysfunction. And there would be other medical con conditions as well uh, which might mimic the symptoms of depression. But even talking more generally than that, I would remind everyone here about the importance of, of good general physical health in any event. I'm always conscious of the effect of, of pain, for instance. Um, occasionally, perhaps we've all met some people who may have perhaps severe art arthritic conditions or other perhaps musculoskeletal skeletal, uh, conditions, which may cause significant pain and could interfere with sleep. Uh, so I think it's really important when we, when we link with our, with our physician, with our doctor or another healthcare provider, that we just take some time to look at, at other physical conditions which might be impacting our mood as well. Naturally enough, it's important to consider other mental health conditions uh, as well. Uh, some of them are listed here on, on the slide. Um, uh, and again, it's important to uh, have some careful consideration of that. Um, it also suggests here that with uh, psychotic uh, depression, that the person may not have had a manic episode or hypomanic episode. Uh, so again, these may be some of the exclusion criteria to consider. When we talk about major depressive disorder with psychotic features, um, what are the psychotic features? Well, most prominent of all in this, in this constellation would be uh, delusional ideas. And we list here a number of different types of delusion. Just to say a little bit about some of them, the delusions of guilt, and we spoke about this uh, a little bit earlier uh, when we spoke about perhaps inappropriate or, in or excessive guilt. Sometimes people uh, can uh, perhaps develop a belief that they have engaged in some crime. The person may confess uh, to the crime, may approach the guardee. And of course, when it's investigated, there's no evidence to support that. A person may have what's called a delusion of enormity, whereby the person uh, is concerned that some act of theirs may have some wider effect in a more global way. So for example, a person may be concerned that some act or omission of theirs could cause a tsunami or could cause an earthquake or some other natural disaster. And I think we know, I think we know of course, that any action that we would take here this evening, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't cause a natural disaster like that. But unfortunately, with major depressive disorder, uh, with psychotic features, in the case of 
maybe the delusion of guilt or the delusion of enormity. For some people, this can happen, and we can appreciate, I guess, the extent of the distress that might occur there. Somatic delusions refer to delusions uh, of, of the body or concerning aspects of our f physical functioning. Uh, delusions of impoverishment or a delusion of poverty is, is, is um, a thought process which can happen quite frequently in, in, in this condition, where a person uh, will be uh, concerned that they're facing financial ruin, or the person may feel that they, um, uh, I guess, somehow uh, have no access to money or that their family may become destitute. And that's quite concerning because a person may begin to believe that it's their fault that their family are at risk of becoming destitute. And a person may begin to believe in all earnestness that their loved ones may be better off without them. And, and we can see the dangerousness of, 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 this, of this really, uh, I guess, powerful uh, thinking. Uh, people can also have a persecutory delusion where the person feels uh, that they are uh, under threat in some way, um, or a nihilistic delusion. I always like to read from my notes with a nihilistic delusion. Um, these occur when the person denies the existence of their body, their mind, their loved ones, or the world around them. The person may believe that they have no mind, no body, or that parts of their body do not exist. So it's an idea of negation, or, or that, an idea of nothingness, perhaps, in the world. Some people, some authors would argue that a nihilistic delusion is, 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 is more rare than the others, but I think it's important to mention, to mention it. Of course, when we look at delusions, when we look at delusions, I think there are certain key um, characteristics of delusions uh, which we need to, to take into, the mi into mind uh, when considering if a thought process actually reaches delusional intensity or perhaps does it not reach delusional intensity? Is it, for example, an overvalued idea or, or a thought which we're just placing too much emphasis on at a given moment in time. So we're looking at the person's description of what's happening, the person's own account in their own words regarding what's happening. We're also looking at the onset and duration. How long has the person had this belief? Is it something, is it a belief which the person has held over the last 10, 15 years, or is it um, a more recent change from the person's previous thinking process. You know, is there a marked change in philosophy, in outlook, perhaps in political leaning, or, or, or in, other, in other areas of, of our lives? So again, we're looking at how recent uh, and, I guess, uh, the, the length of time the person has had that belief. We're also looking at the frequency you know, is this belief with the person every day? Uh, does the person perhaps think about this two or three times per week, two or three times per month? So we're looking at the frequency as well to try to unpick uh, the nature of the belief. The degree of interference that the belief is having with the person's life. So something I would always ask is, has the person acted on this belief? So say, for example, because of this belief, perhaps we move out of our house. Uh, perhaps we uh, stop seeing a particular friend. Perhaps we stop going to a particular location. Perhaps we stop using the telephone because of this belief. So does it impact on our behavior or on what we do? Is the person distressed by this belief? A lot of the time, naturally, the person will be distressed by the belief, but we can't assume it or we can't take it for granted. We need to ask. What is the degree of conviction or what is the degree of meaning the person uh, places uh, upon this belief? Uh, does the person believe that it's 100% true? 
does the person think that, well, actually, you know, I thought this was true, but actually I'm not so sure. I, I think it might just be uh, something I was concerned about. I'm not really convinced by it now. Or is it the case uh, that the person feels uh, that this might be part of an illness process? Maybe this is something which uh, is, is in my mind. Or in fact, uh, is it something which is definitely happening, which is, uh, I guess, externally influenced and mediated by others? So, so these distinctions are important. Does the person think this is real? And to what extent does the person think it is real? Of course, in major depressive disorder with uh, psychotic features, the delusions are only present during uh, the context of the depressive episode. They, they resolve as the depressive episode resolves. The other key grouping of symptoms of psychosis uh, that a person can experience would be hallucinations. And with the hallucinations, some people would say, in fact, a lot of people would say that auditory hallucinations are, are the most common, uh, followed in order by visual, which is sight, tactile touch, olfactory smell, gustatory taste, and regrettably, the hallucinations are often, again, distressing and derogatory in nature. Uh, the person can uh, f be very afflicted uh, by this derogatory commentary um, or, or a vice or, or vices, um, and again, the person uh, may believe with a, with, a, with a large degree of conviction that these vices are real and they are generated by some external source. Okay. Just a couple of final points before I hand over to Finn. I did say I'd be brief. In the DSM-5, uh, mood congruent psychotic features and mood incongruent psychotic features are mentioned. And what this simply means, a mood congruent psychotic feature is a delusion or, a, or an hallucination. The content is consistent with the typical depressive themes of guilt or low self-worth. Whereas in the mood incongruent psychotic feature, uh, that, that isn't the case. Depending on which textbook or which source you read, which article. Um, there are different rates given, but generally speaking, uh, for major depressive disorder with psychotic features, it's said that four people per 1,000 in the general population may experience this condition. And higher rates, up to 15 to 20%, are seen in those people diagnosed with major depression. And indeed, uh, up to 25% uh, may be seen in, 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 in those people who are in, in an inpatient setting who have major depressive disorder. So there can be little doubt about it, I feel, uh, that, that, that this condition um, is, is concerning. It's uh, very distressing for the person, for their family members and, and, and loved ones. And there, there is an argument, in fact, that uh, more research and more study uh, of, of this particular, uh, I guess, uh, subgrouping of, of, of depressive presentations is, is merited. Uh, and, you know, perhaps others mightn't agree with that statement, but um, certainly I think there is scope for, for more study uh, of the, the treatment options. So, I'm going to hand over to Finn, and we'll have an opportunity for uh, some questions towards the end. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Can I say from the outset that I'm not here to talk about DSM-5 and groupings and all these kind of stuff, because I find that that stuff is actually removes you from the process of having a mental health condition, no matter what it is. 
And um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Now, from the outside, I have schizophrenia. So I have an illness with psychosis. And Timmy asked me to come here and talk about psychosis and about my journey and my story and my life to try and bring across a real version, a reality to what Timmy is classifying and talking about. But to be, to, from the outset, to say that I have schizophrenia. Um, I have suffered from depression in the past, but generally the depression has been brought on by, I have had a psychotic episode, I have been hospitalized, and within three to six months, I have a depressive episode after having had a psychotic episode. So it's, it's a very particular way it happens for me. Um, and yes, I have been given medication for schizophrenia. I've also been given medication for depression, but I no longer take the depression medication. I take the schizophrenia medication, and I have done for the last 22 years of my life. So my story, Life Confused. Um, 20, over 20 years ago, I had a psychotic episode on a film set in Clara County, Offaly. Um, I had a psychotic episode that was so severe that I ended up in hospital within uh, 24 hours of having this episode. Um, I um, became increasingly unwell over a period of days to a level that I had stopped sleeping for four or five days. And to put a word on some of the delusions and hallucinations I was having, I remember walking down the road thinking, I need to find a park, I need to find somewhere peaceful, I need somewhere where I can calm down and everything will be okay. And I was walking down the road and the cars were driving up and down the road and the window wipers of the cars were going like this and I thought that way meant yes and that way meant no. Um, I thought I'd been drugged, I thought that um, I had won the lotto. When I went to ho hospital, which was actually St John of God's, um, I wasn't involuntarily detained, but I signed myself in. I thought I was signing away the, 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 a jackpot. I, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what was going on. And then I ended up in a hospital in front of these people, the multidisciplinary team. Now, I'm pretty sure a lot of people in this room know what an MDT is. But if you don't know what an MDT is, I'll quickly outline it. A multidisciplinary team is a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a social worker, an occupational therapist, a registrar, a nurse, a couple of students, um, and I don't know if I've left it in else, but that's basically it. And I sat in front of the MDT team and a consultant psychiatrist said to me, says, so um, when a boulder rolls down a hill, does it gather any moss? And I was, what are you talking about? I just did not get it. I thought, why are you asking me these questions? Why am I supposed to understand what the process was? Now, I was very lucky. I responded to the medication very quickly and the delusions kind of left. And I was left there thinking, what's happened? Why am I in a hospital? What's going on? And then I under started to understand the function of these people that I was meeting and how everybody, you know, the, the, the psychologist took my history and, you know, I talked and talked and talked for days and days and days about my whole life and how wonderful, how, how I'd been led to this point and how great my life was and how not great my life was and so on and so forth. And I understood that something major had happened and that I had got an illness, but I wasn't willing to accept it. So for maybe two to three years after having been hospitalized, I would, could not accept that I had schizophrenia. So I went, I, I had been given medication, I went through periods of not taking the medication, I went through periods of taking the medication, and I realized, actually, I have an illness, but I am not, and this is a very important point, um, I, have, I have schizophrenia, but I'm not defined by my illness. And it was like an epiphany, it was like a light bulb. It's like, I am not defined by my illness, my illness does not make me who I am, it is just an illness that I have, and it is only part of me. So, 
I had to learn the MT and how to navigate services. And it was, it, at the outset, it was terribly overwhelming, you know? But the thing is, I was given a diagnosis. Now, the thing about a diagnosis is, is it's a life-changing event. It really is. Now, I know I said, you know, it's kind of slagging Timmy off a little bit, you know, the DSM, but I'm not really, you know. I was given the diagnosis and I accepted it. But what does that mean on a practical level? You know, and I'll just tell you, say a little thing about it, diagnosis. About 30 years ago, I was across the road in St. James's being seen by a, by a psychiatrist because I wasn't doing very well in my life. And after 40 minutes, I was told I had bipolar disorder. After 40 minutes, I was told I was, had bipolar disorder. And I walked away from, from that psychiatrist. And, I did, and then six or seven years ago, I had a psychotic episode. And it turned out I didn't have bipolar disorder. I had schizophrenia. But the point is, is that how can somebody make that call or judgment within 40 minutes of meeting you? Because I think the thing about a diagnosis is it takes time. As Timmy said, you've got to see the person's experience and the lived-in person and how they present themselves and how they feel and, and, and what's going on for them. Which brings me to the idea of psychotic episodes and delusions. And the thing about it is, is, is how do you, like I, I described for you, you know, window wipers, left, left no. I remember being in, having taken by train by the producer of the film, and this was a very public psychotic episode. This is, you know, when you go nuts in a film, uh, like, you know, if you, fart in, if you fart in Clara, they smell it in Ardmore Studios, literally <laughs> within 10 minutes, you know. Um, it's, it's not a very pleasant experience. And, and I remember people ringing me up and saying, are you okay? And I remember I found out who my friends were really quickly, you know? But I just back to this thing about psychosis and delusions. I was in Houston Station, just around the corner, and um, I heard, Tsh! and I heard, Tsh -tsh! and I thought, yes, no. And I was trying to make sense of that and trying to process that information and understand what is actually ununderstandable. You, it's because it's frightening. And the thing about psychosis is it can be terrifying when you don't know what is real. When you're trying to judge reality, but you're, the way reality is presented to you through either auditory or you know, hearing voices or, or visual delusions or whatever. You know, I'll give you another example. I, was, I, I wasn't very well and I went up to the bank machine and I put the card in the bank machine and, um, and I tapped in my number and then a little sentence came up saying, we're trying to steal all your money and then it disappeared. And then uh, about five weeks later, when I was okay again, I went back to the bank machine and said the sentence was actually something else, but I had misread it. And my brain had supplanted a message to me that wasn't real. So that's quite scary. But the thing is, is that I have learned through time to kind of accept that and to, to have a system. Like, for example, if I'm feeling unwell and I'm in a hotel in, giving a real example, I was in a hotel in Goy once, I was feeling particularly unwell. I was, I was uh, down the street and I was beginning to hear things and there were people ahead of me and people behind me and, and my sense of what was going on was skewed. And I actually went to the hotel, I sat down, I ordered a cup of tea and I started to calm myself and I was looking at the TV going, no, that thing about the war in Iraq is really nothing to do with me. It's okay. I had the paranoid thought and then I dismissed it. So I learned how to cope um, in that way by allowing the thought but learning how to dismiss them. Which brings me to my next point. You know, like, I, I know Anne was here, Anne Sheridan was here, I think, last month, and she was talking about recovery, but, uh, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about recovery and what, and what, and what that means for me, you know, and, and um, I know there are points of this that people may agree or disagree with, and that's okay, because I think recovery is for whatever it is for you that works. But the thing is, for me, it's eat well, which not eat loads, but just eat well, you know, good food, sleep, manage stress, take my medication, I, I, I will take uh, antipsychotics for the rest of my life and I accept that. 
and I'm realistic. Now, let me tell you two stories about managing and stress and being realistic. Um, I, a number of years ago, worked as a uh, programme leader on a film course down in Ballyfermot. Uh, I was the head of department and um, I was, it was a very stressful job and um, I was f facing into, um, into student film shoots and supervising them and realising that I was going to be doing 60 to 70 hour weeks and that I wasn't going to be looking after myself. So I was realistic. I typed out, dear miss or whoever, uh, thank you very much, uh, but I'm now officially resigning from this course and I faxed that in for, on Tuesday and didn't turn up on Wednesday. I took my mental health more seriously than my job. Now, I, it has been said to me in, in countless times that I've given this particular talk that, well, you could afford to do that. And I said, well, no, I couldn't actually. I was 40,000 euros in debt, you know, and I had to work really hard to get out of that. But I realized that I had to put my mental health first and that I had to look after myself first. And I couldn't put myself in a situation that was going to be stressful and lead me back to a hospital, because that's going back a step. So I was realistic in what I could take on and realistic in the stress that I could manage. Now, um, the thing is, is that um, there's another one that I thought of earlier when I was looking at these slides on the way in in the car, and I thought, oh, geez, of course, exercise. Exercise is great. You know, it releases endorphins, but not only does it release endorphins, it actually calms you down. You know, I, I, you know just, and just to tell you, I was the head, head of a film course. I'm now a school warden. I'm now a lollipop man. I cross kids in Terenure, you know, and, and I work 10 hours a week. And yes, I have worked in the film industry, and yes, I will continue to work in the film industry, but I my financial needs are taken care of. I'm lucky, I have a, a wife who works also, but my financial needs are taken care of by being a school warden, and it's stressless. You know? So many times a day, and you know, it's great. And, and I walk to work and I walk back, you know? So, so I walk six, seven kilometers a day, you know? And, and it's great, but I'm realistic about what I can take on. And I'm realistic about how much I'm willing to take on, which doesn't mean I won't make a film because someday I hopefully will make another film. And, and, uh, but I'm realistic about, uh, you know, I have rules now. I, I will only work with people I know. I certainly will never share a room in Clare County Offaly with somebody I didn't know like I did that time, which ha really added to the lack of sleep and getting unwell part of it. But it brings me to another point. It's something that I have to deal with. And because I, you know, I, I can talk about myself and everything, but it's just a little bit about stigma. You know, this is not very helpful to somebody with schizophrenia. This is not very helpful to somebody with a bipolar disorder. This is not very helpful to anybody with any form of psychosis. 1,200 killed by mental patients. Shop 10 years ago, Tull exposes care crisis. You know, A, it's not true, B, just because you have schizophrenia, schizophrenia doesn't mean you're a psychopath because the media love to gamble these two words together. Psychosis and psychopath, they're readily interchangeable, but they mean totally different things. So there are, let's just talk a little bit about stigma. There's, there's, there's like four forms of stigma. There's public stigma, such as one I've talked about, the, the press and the media. There's prejudice, there's discrimination. I remember I told somebody that in my work in, in the college that I had schizophrenia and that person never looked at me. Same since that point. I was the same person I was, but they, their whole attitude to me changed, which was discrimination. And then there's self-stigma, which is the real nugget. Now I'm gonna tell you a story about self-stigma. I participate in a program called OLUS, which is it's an information program for people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And it's it's a it's a um, it's a, it's an eight week information model. I'll talk a little bit about it at the end. But anyway, the point is, is that I took part in the video to promote the OLUS program. And the video was launched in Trinity College, and there I, wa I was up on the screen saying, oh, by the way, I have schizophrenia, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, 
this journalist from the Irish Times came over and said to me, said, I, I'd like you to, uh, to interview you. Would you mind? I said, that's absolutely fine. Uh, and I did the interview and I ended up in the newspapers and, and that was absolutely fine. But the thing was, I had never told my brother-in-law that I had, had schizophrenia. I was afraid. And why would I be afraid? But anyway, so, so and the one day I was ringing my, my brother-in-law is a chief superintendent, right? And, and I was ringing him up for some legal advice. And I rang up and said, uh, uh, and uh, by the way, I've got schizophrenia. He says, I sure didn't we know, didn't we read it in the health supplement of the Irish Times? You know? And sure, don't we love you anyway? It made no difference to him. And so I realized from that point that why should I care? Why should I care what people think about the quote-unquote psychiatric disorder that I have, or the mental health condition, whatever words you want to use, as long as it's not nutball, you know? Um, but I had self-stigmatized myself. So that's another form of stigma. And then there's these interesting, and this actually, this slide came from St. Patrick's research, and I stole it from them, so thank you, St. Patrick's. But anyway, did you know that one in four people, 63% are aware that one in four will experience a mental health difficulty? But only 53% of people agree that people with a mental health problem are trustworthy. 29% would not trust someone with a previous mental health difficulty to babysit. Only one in five believe that Irish employers are uncomfortable employing someone with a mental health problem. And I'm afraid these get a bit blurry because it was a small slide that I sold it, but then 67% agree that Irish people feel that being treated for a mental health problem is a sign of personal failure. Which I find, I find that terribly depressing to use a term, but I find that quite upsetting really, you know. Um, only 28% believe that people with mental health issues are treated the same as everyone else. And only 57% think that Irish people would willingly accept someone with a mental health problem as a close friend. So, you know, I'm not here to be on a soapbox, but I, I, I am here to provoke you to think about the situation that you may be in, your close family may be in, your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, whatever it is, and that the stigma that you or I or anyone may face through the journey of your life. And then it brings me to the whole idea of advocacy. Now, does it, did, I'm going to open this up to the floor for a second. Does anybody want to give me the definition of advocacy? Pleading someone's cause. Thank you. Okay, pleading someone's cause. So there are actually five forms of advocacy, right? So there's self-advocacy. So I'm very good at self-advocating. When I go, I see a psychiatrist every eight weeks, two months, and I'm very good. And I, uh, you know, it's it's like a it's almost like a mantra at this point. But I'm very good at asking for help and looking for myself, looking out for myself. Let me say. But then there's peer advocates. So the, it might be um, somebody from your family, it might be somebody from the Irish Advocacy Network who will advocate on your behalf. Then there's professional advocacy. So say anybody in this room was involuntarily detained. Um, after you get involuntarily detained, you know, um, uh, I think the, the old term for it was sectioned. But after you get involuntarily detained, there's a point where there's a tribunal and you're actually assigned a lawyer or a solicitor. Well, that's a professional advocate. Then there's public policy advocates. So there would be AWARE, there would be SHINE, there would be um, Peterhouse, all these organizations, they're public policy advocates. And then there's family members in advocacy. So there's people who advocate for family members. You know, because because um, the thing about it, obviously is, is, you know, what often gets left behind actually when somebody has psychosis or or get presents or goes into a hospital is that the family get left behind and they kind of le sometimes get left almost on the outside, and and sometimes you need to be able to advocate for that and and to know how to ask questions and and more importantly to know who to ask questions. Because you know there's the, the, there, there is this, um, 
you know, my rights are my rights, and if I say I do not want my brother or my father or my mother or my sister hearing about my case, then under the Hippocratic Oath, the, the doctor has to, has to respect that. But that doesn't mean that their doors are firmly closed, because information doesn't always have to go two ways. That, a good psychiatrist or a good psychologist or a good social worker will listen to a family's issues and take on board those issues. Maybe they can't respond to them because they've been asked not to, but they will listen. And it gives people a whole, a, 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 a whole picture of, of, dare I use the word, patient, you know? Because like, I get often introduced as service user and I actually prefer the word patient because at the end of the day, it is a medical condition and, I'm, and I, I am seeing a doctor. Whether you agree a psychiatrist is a doctor or not is kind of irrelevant. They are a doctor. They're a doctor who trained and then specialized in psychiatry. Um, and then I just to talk a little bit about the OLIS program. So the OLIS program is... is um, how would I describe it? It's an information service. Oh, this is the Irish for information. And it's, it's um, co-facilitated by service users and family and carers and clinicians. So it's quite unique in that respect in that it's an eight-week course with eight separate modules. So one of them is how a diagnosis is made, one of them is on medication, one of them is on coping, one of them is on communication, one of them is on your rights, one of them such as, um, such as actually making a will and capacity and all those very important things. Um, and, uh, but it's co-facilitated. There's a family and carers course and there's a service users course. And as a service user, I have co-facilitated uh, OLIS courses, and I've sat there. Now, I've actually co-facilitated family and carers groups. Um, it just because it worked out that way. And I got asked, and I said yes. And, and what was interesting was the elephant in the room was, what's your diagnosis? You know, because you're sitting there, and I mean, with all these people who are, who are very distraught because their son or daughter or brother or sister is terribly unwell, and they're sitting in, in the room with somebody who has the same condition. Um, or uh, something similar, you know, and 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 we always hit that on the hit that really quickly, and say, well, actually, my diagnosis is schizophrenia, and there's always this relief. All right, so you're there at the other end, and you're okay. Yeah, I am at the other end, and I, yes, I am okay because I know how to look after myself. And I'm to go back three slides, realistic about what I can and cannot do. Um, now, have I run out of time or? So that's me. Are there any questions? <laughs>